All right, good evening. If you're outside in the cafe, come on in. We're going to get started. I am going to open up with a word of prayer and then introduce our guests. Father, thank you so much for uh, bringing us together as we uh, hear from uh, Dr. Lyle again and this important information and encouragement that we get, Father, from the word uh, that what we have is accurate and we have the confidence, Lord, that uh, the God we serve and the Bible we read is um, it's infallible. And we thank you for that, Father. So we pray for this uh, evening, Lord, that you bless and encourage us in our hearts uh, to be um, those Bible students and apologists, if you will, uh, to help others understand the scriptures. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I know you guys probably were here over the weekend, but uh, we have our guest returning, Dr. Jason Lyle. He's the founder of the Biblical Science Institute, the Creation Science Ministry, which helps others defend the Christian worldview against claims that the Bible, particularly Genesis, uh, is unscientific. And uh, Dr. Lyle strongly believes Christians should be encouraged that science confirms what the Bible teaches and that the story of particles to people evolution is a myth. And so you're going to be encouraged by his presentation. And, and uh, so if you guys please help me welcome Dr. Jason Lyle. All right, well, thank you again, and it's good to be back with you, and I get to talk about how science confirms biblical creation. And we're going to look at several different branches of science tonight, but I think it's helpful for Christians to know the basics of different fields of science. 
And we can all do that. Um, the, the areas I'm going to talk about tonight are not my area of expertise, but uh, I rely on others that do have expertise in these areas, and to, just to learn the basics and see how science confirms what the Bible teaches. Creationists and evolutionists have the same world. We have access to the same fossils. We can look at the same patterns in genetics. We can look at the same stars and galaxies, and we draw different conclusions about what they mean and about how they got there, about how old they are. And that's because we're looking through different lenses. And I'm looking through the lens of scripture, which is what we should do, because that's God's word, and it's accurate. It gives us the true history of the universe. My secular colleagues, when they look at the world, they look at it through a secular lens, the lens of evolution. And so they already have some thoughts in their mind, they already have some ideas about how things came to be, because they're making certain assumptions, like naturalism, uniformitarianism, the idea that rates and conditions are generally constant, and, and, and that, that Earth's features have been formed gradually, and so on. And that pain and disease and suffering led, to, led one kind of organism into the next, by, evolu by you know, natural selection, re re eliminating the unfit, and so on. And they look at that, when they look at the world in that way, they draw conclusions about its age, and so on, that are consistent with what they've already accepted to be true. In the creation worldview, we look at it through the seven seas of history. We covered those last night, so I won't, I won't repeat those this evening. But that's just a summary of biblical history from creation to corruption all the way through to Christ and then the consummation. And the consummation's yet to happen in its fullness. So we're going to look at three different areas of science tonight. And all I want to do is show you that the science is consistent with what the Bible teaches and really, is, really challenges an evolutionary mindset. You really have to... You really have to um, strain credulity to believe in evolution. You really do. So we're going to look at three branches of science. We're going to look at genetics, the study of heredity, how traits are passed on from one organism to the next. We're going to look at information theory, which a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it's really powerful evidence for creation. And then we're going to look at geology, the study of rocks, and we'll also look at the fossils that are found within those rocks, which could be considered paleontology. So we'll look at that as well. So let's start with uh, genetics and jump right in. The study of heredity. The study of how animals change from one generation to the next. Do animals change? Do dogs change? They do change. What do they change into? Dogs. Yeah, dogs change into dogs. And that's not really evolution, that's just dogs. Because uh, we read in Genesis that God created animals according to their kinds or after its kind. And that appears to be the reproductive limit of an organism. God doesn't say animals reproduce exact copies of themselves, right? They reproduce after their kind. Their offspring are similar to the parents. And God has built in variation to organisms. And we'll see how that works when we study the details here. But, but we would expect animals would remain the same kind no matter how many generations take place. Dogs never become cats. But you can get different breeds of dog. So let's just be honest about that. It's also important to recognize that kind is not the same thing as species. I've heard some well-intentioned creationists saying, well, yeah, all the species are the same. That's not really true. You can get what's called speciation, where um, a new species can arise. Like there's a group of mosquitoes that's separated from its parent population, and then 100 years later, they're brought back together, and they can't interbreed anymore due to what's called genetic drift. And they're classified, therefore, as a new species, but they're still mosquitoes. They always have been mosquitoes, and unfortunately, they always will be mosquitoes, okay? So you can get speciation, but they're the same kind. And this is, this is something where the evolutionists sometimes misrepresent us, because I have heard evolutionists claim, well, creationists believe that God created all the species as we see them today. That is not true. Animals have changed since creation, okay? Uh, there were no poodles in the Garden of Eden. It was a paradise. You're not going to have poodles in there, okay? So animals have ch This is not what we believe. This is fixity of species. We don't hold to that because it's not biblical. What the Bible would teach would be something more like this, variation within a kind. So animals have changed. They've diversified. And you can get the different breeds of dogs. That's not a problem. We'll see how that works. But they remain the same kinds. And so if you want to get a dog with long fur or short fur, we can do that for you. But if you want a dog with wings, you're out of luck. And we'll see why that, we'll see that the evidence is consistent with the creation view that dogs remain dogs, humans remain humans. 
in the evolutionary view, there really are no kinds, really. Because in, in the evolutionary mindset, everything is descended from a common ancestor. All life is related. You're related to broccoli in the evolutionary worldview. I mentioned that to a group of atheists one time. I said, you realize in your worldview, you, you believe you're related, related to broccoli. And one of them afterwards came up to me and said, uh, weren't you kind of insulting us by claiming we believe we're related to broccoli? I said, isn't that what you believe? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, there you go then, right? It's your belief. It sounds silly. Change your belief. Don't shoot the messenger. But in the evolutionary worldview, there's a continuum. And so it's kind of, a, it's kind of amazing to me that we can classify organisms if that were true. Because wouldn't everything be in the process of evolving into something else? The, the idea of discrete classification, I think it makes a lot more sense in the creation view. But in any case, to see which of these views is most consistent with science, we'll have to take a look at DNA and, and some of those things. But I just wanted to point out, though, that the, in the creation view, we do believe that animals change, but they change within their kinds. Of course, some of them have gone extinct. There's some uh, kinds that have gone extinct, like dinosaurs aren't around anymore. There are some uh, kinds where certain varieties have gone extinct, but other varieties remain, like elephants. Mammoths, we think, are part of the elephant kind. The mammoths are gone, but the African and Indian elephant remain. So that's, that's what we'd expect. Whereas in the evolutionary view, everything is in the process of evolution, and many things have gone, they agree many things have gone extinct, so there's no dispute there. So DNA is the molecule of heredity. It's a very long structure, a very long connection of atoms that occurs in the cells of your body, and it looks like a twisted ladder. And on the rungs of this ladder, connecting the two strands, are nucleotide base pairs. And there's four different nucleotide base pairs that you'll see abbreviated by those four letters, C, G, A, and T, which is what the names start with. And the C's and G's always connect, and the T's and the A's always connect. So if A's on one strand, T's on the other and so on. But on, if you just look at one strand, so the second strand is redundant. If you know what's on one strand, you can compute what's on the other. It's the opposite base pair. But on one strand, you don't know, just by looking at it, what letter's going to come next. So you might C, C, T, 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 G, A, and so on. You don't know which letter's going to come next. And based on the order in which those are, um, are, are written, you can spell out the instructions to make the proteins that make you. It's pretty amazing. It's similar to the way you could spell help with, uh, uh, in, in Morse code with beads on a rope. By the way you arrange them, you can spell out information. So DNA has the instructions to make you, which I think is awesome. I mean, we can get all this information on a Blu-ray, and that's impressive. God put the information to make you on a molecule. That's really impressive. And you have uh, three billion of those letters, three billion uh, nucleotide base pairs times two, because you have two sets of DNA, one from dad, one from mom, so you have six billion base pairs. And I don't know if that's a lot, or if it's like, really, I'm only six billion base pairs? I mean, I'm awfully complicated. I mean, <laughs> I, don't know what's more, I don't know what's more perplexing, that it's so many or so few. But in any case, um, that those make the proteins that make us. And the reason that you are a person and not a watermelon is you've got the instructions to make a person, and a watermelon has the instructions to make a watermelon. And you got the long end of the stick on that one. So there you go. And by the way, some of, our, some of our DNA is the same as a watermelon. Why? Because we use some of the same proteins. That's important because if it weren't, I mean, God could have made all the organisms using totally different proteins, but then what would we eat? The only thing we'd be able to eat is each other. So that would not be a good plan, right? <laughs> so because God made certain proteins common to different organisms, we can gain nutrients from things like watermelon. So we'd expect some of them to be the same. See, evolutionists think that's proof of common descent. Really, it's proof that God doesn't want us to be cannibals, right? Okay. Now, you have two sets of DNA, and your traits are determined by the combination of the different genes. Gen a gene is a section of the DNA that determines a trait, like eye color or hair color, things like that. And you have two genes on each. For, for, you get one gene from dad, one gene from mom at each location on your DNA. And, um, and your parents, they, they have two sets of DNA, which they got from their two parents, which they got from their two parents, and so on, all the way back to Adam and Eve, who got their DNA from God. And so when mom and dad have kids, uh, it's, it's an amazing process, but basically each child gets one of the two genes from each parent. And you don't know in advance which one they're going to get. So the first child might get that gene from dad and that gene from mom, and then the next ones and the next ones. Oh, and so they have, they have a unique set of DNA 
they still got all the instructions from their parents, but they have a unique combination. They have a combination their parents don't have. Now, the next child, he gets a different set, and so he looks a little different. And the next child, and so on. And so that's what you might notice, that you look a little bit like your dad, you look a little bit like your mom, but then again, you have some traits that neither parent has. That's because you have a unique combination of DNA, you see. Isn't that, isn't that ingenious? <laughs> really, it's brilliant, because the number of combinations of, of different genes, you start with two people, mom and dad, the, the number of unique combinations of DNA is far greater than the number of atoms in the universe. And so it's a great way. So all the information to make everyone in this room God encoded in Adam and Eve. That's cool. Now we'll see that there's, there's some issues that have crept up. There's mutations and things like that. We'll talk about those. But because, because God used the combination of those two things and because there's a, when you run the number of com combinations of six billion uh, base pairs, that's, that's enormous. You can get tremendous variety and it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see. I, I love meeting different Christians and seeing the different uh, talents that God's given them and the different interests they have. It's just a wonderful thing. Uh, here, here it is with uh, blood type. So with blood type, there's three possible genes, A, B, and O. And of course, you only get two. You get one from dad, you get one from mom. So if a person has this combination, A and A, their blood type's A, that's easy. If they have A and O, let's say they get A from dad and O from mom, their blood type is still A because A is dominant and O is recessive. If a, if a dominant and a recessive gene go together, the dominant wins, wins and you, it expresses that trait. So, and they're usually represented by capital letters and recessive by lowercase in, in, in many instances. So blood type B is produced by this combination. If you have an A and a B, they're co-dominant, and your blood type is AB. The only way you can have blood type O is to have both O alleles, both O genes, okay? And so there's, there's the four possible human blood types. And there's the positive negative factor, that's another set of genes. But in any case, so here's the thing that I find neat. If mom has blood type A, and let's say it's the, what we call the heterozygous combination. Heterozygous means uh, O and A as opposed to homozygous, where they're both A. If mom has the heterozygous A and dad has the heterozygous B, the kids could have any possible blood type. Because you see, they could get the A allele from mom and the O from dad and their blood type is A. Or they could get the B from dad and the O from mom and their blood type is B. They could get the A from mom and the B from dad and their blood type is AB. Or they could get the O from mom or the O from dad and their blood type's O. So, you know, some kid says, Mom, your blood type's A, my dad's blood type's B, why is mine O? Am I adopted? No, you're not adopted. It's just, that's the, that's the way it works out. So if you have some traits that neither parent has, that's why. You have a unique combination. Unless you have an identical twin, you have a unique combination of DNA. And we're finding that even with twins, the fingerprints are different, so it's a little more complicated than that. But in terms of the basics DNA, that's how it works. Here it is with a skin color. Now this is simplified, but basically there's a, there's a pigment called melanin that occurs in your skin, and the more um, melanin you have, the, and, and the, the more it's spread out in the cells, the darker complected you are. And so um, if you have these type of genes up here, you're very dark skinned. If you have these type of genes, you're very, you're very light skinned. And of course the body can adjust that a little bit. You know, if you're exposed to sunlight, it'll produce, you know, you can get tan, you can produce more melanin and so on. A couple different forms of melanin, we won't go into the details. But um, the point is, if you're in this box up here and you have only the capital letters and you get married to somebody that's in that box up there, your kids are going to have dark skin. There's, there's no avoiding that. And the same as if you're in the light box or if you're in, let's say, this box right here where it's capital A, capital A, lowercase b, lowercase b, and you get married to somebody in that box, your kids will be in that box. But the thing that's interesting is if you're off axis, let's say you're up here and you have uh, big A, little a, big B, little b, and you get married to somebody in that box, you both have kind of medium brown skin. Your kids could have any skin shade from very dark to very light in one generation. And there's still places in the world where that happens. There's certain places in India where at the same dinner table, you know, brother and sister sit down and one's very dark and one's very light. Okay, so that's how races work. It's not it's really only one race, the human race. It's just we have little differences in genetics due to people, there's some people that like to marry people that, you know, have a particular skin shade or whatever, and that's going to lock in, um, if you have what's called the homozygous combination where you have the same letters, uh, that's going to lock that in, that trait. So we think Adam and Eve probably had medium brown skin. We think they were probably up in that box. There's other ways God could have done it. 
but uh, they weren't they weren't both down here like you know in the in the lower right like you see depicted sometimes we think they probably had medium brown skin and so their children they could have been from very dark to very light in one generation uh, we're going to focus in on dogs because dogs have a lot of variety built into them god built built dogs uh, with the the with lots of different possible traits depending on the combination of genes that surface over time now in the evolutionary view Bacteria, or something like bacteria, single-celled microbes, as they reproduced over millions of years, eventually became horses. That's what evolutionists believe. They do. Now, bacteria have some information in their genome. They have the information to produce bacteria, okay? And that's why they're able to do that. They have the information to produce the, the basic structure that you see there. And it's still, it's still pretty amazing. I mean, we haven't produced anything like that. Uh, that can self-replicate and so on. Uh, a horse has a lot more information in its DNA. It's not just that it has more DNA, which it does. It has more instructions. It has instructions that the bacteria lack. A horse has instructions in its DNA to make eyeballs. Bacteria do not have those instructions, and therefore they cannot make eyeballs. Horse has instructions to make bones. Bacteria do not have those instructions, and therefore cannot make bones. You see what I'm saying? So it seems to me that if evolution were true, at some point, these bacteria, in the process of reproducing, had to gain brand new information, right? Because these don't have the information to make bones. That does. So at some point, they had to acquire the information to make bones and skin and eyes and hooves and whatever, whatever you can think of. Anything that a horse has, that information at some point had to be added to the DNA of those bacteria. That's so important to understand. Evolution doesn't work. It can't get off the ground unless you can increase the information content in the DNA. You can never turn one kind into another without adding new information because a horse has more information than the bacteria. I'm saying that a few ways because I want to make sure you get it. Evolution requires an increase in information. If you don't have an increase in information, you don't have evolution. You can have variation within a kind, but not evolution. And that's important because all the processes that we observe scientifically reduce the information in the DNA. They don't increase it. Or maybe they're neutral, but they don't increase it. For example, natural selection. A lot of people think that natural selection is the same as evolution because Darwin tried to kind of connect the two. And that was, a, uh, that was a, an error in reasoning that many, even Christians have fallen for that, unfortunately. But no, natural selection is the opposite of evolution. And let me show you why. Natural selection is a true principle. It's biblical. There are biblical examples of it. And it's very easy to understand. Let's suppose you have two dogs. And let's suppose that each dog has a gene for short fur and a gene for long fur. And therefore, let's suppose those genes have a combined effect. And so you have medium length fur. Now, this, again, this is simplified. But I want you, the basic genetic principles here are true. So let's say each of these dogs has medium fur because they have, a short, they have information for short and long. And that combines to produce medium. And these dogs fall in love, and they, have, uh, they reproduce. They have some pups. Now, some of the pups are going to get the short gene from mom and the short gene from dad, and they will have short fur. Some of the pups will get the short gene from one parent, the long gene from the other. In fact, 50% of the offspring statistically would end up with that combination. They'd have medium-length fur just like their parents. And then some of the pups would get the long gene from dad and the long gene from mom, and they would have very long fur. Okay? So in, in one generation, you can immediately have a great degree of variation within a kind. Variation within a kind. We started with medium length uh, hair and we ended up with dogs that some of them have medium length hair, some of them short, some of them long. But the information was already there in the parents, wasn't it? There's no information that the offspring have that the parents didn't have. The offspring just have, a, in the case of the first and the third, they have a unique combination. Okay, so there's no evolution so far because we haven't gained any new information. We started with information for short and long and by combination medium, and we ended up with information for short, long, and by combination medium. Now, suppose the environment gets very cold. Oh, and so the dogs that have the shorter and medium length fur, oh, they, they have a tough time in that cold environment, right? But the dog that has the longer fur, he thrives in that environment. The dogs that are not so well insulated, sadly, they die. Very sad. Yeah. I didn't say natural selection was nice. I just said it's true. In a fallen world, it's true. Animals sometimes die. 
or maybe they don't die, but they're, they're, they have to spend all their time finding an environment to, to stay in, and so they can't reproduce because they can't find each other. They have to stay in a warm environment. Whereas these dogs are free to frolic out in the cold and, and find a mate. And when they reproduce, what kind of pups are they going to have? Pups with long fur. And you can see that's the only combination possible now. They can only get a short gene from long, or a long gene from mom, a long gene from, from dad, and therefore have long fur. That's the only combination that's possible because the information for short fur has been eliminated from the population by natural selection. Natural selection reduces the information in the genome. It's the opposite of evolution. You see, we started with information for short, long, and by combination medium, and we ended up with just information for long. The information for short has been lost because the animals that had that information perished. That's what natural selection does. It's simply differential reproduction. Animals that are better equipped to survive and reproduce in an environment do so. Now, if we reverse the situation, if we started things over again, you got all three varieties, but this time, let's assume that the environment gets very hot. Now what's gonna happen? Well, the dogs that have the longer fur, they don't do so well in a hot environment, right? And so sadly, they die of heat exhaustion. Whereas the dogs that have the shorter fur, they're able to uh, get rid of that heat, disperse it more easily. And so they meet other dogs that have survived because they also are able to dissipate heat. And when they have pups, the pups are gonna have short fur, right? Because that's the only combination that's left. And so uh, this is a great example of adaptation. This is one kind of adaptation. This is a generational adaptation. The, the environment got very warm and lo and behold, the dogs ended up with short with short fur. Why? Because they saw that the environment was warm and they decided, I'm going to reprogram myself. No. Because if they didn't already have short fur, they just died and they weren't able to pass it on. So animals do adjust to their environment, but that's because if they're not already adjusted to envi their environment, they perish or they're not able to reproduce in as great a number. And now, th this is, again, this is an evolution because we haven't increased any information. We started with information for short, long, and medium. And we ended up with just information for short. This is a reduction of information. Natural selection reduces, at best, the information in the genome. It never increases it. It can't. You can't, you know, you, you can't increase the information by killing the organisms that have some of it. That's all, that's all natural selection refers to. And so we find, lo and behold, dogs that end up in the cold climates tend to have the longer, thicker fur. Those that end up in the hot climates tend to have the shorter, thinner fur. Right? And with dogs being a mobile organism, if they're smart, maybe they can go to the location that suits them. That's another possibility that won't work for plants, but it works for uh, animals pretty well. So we don't need to have two of each of these different breeds of dogs on Noah's Ark. We just need two dogs. That's all you need on Noah's Ark. And they go off and they multiply, they reproduce, and they take certain traits with them. They spread away from the mountains of Ararat. That's where the Ark landed. And they carry certain traits with them. And if those traits are conducive to survival in that environment, great. The dogs reproduce, and you're fine. If, if, the, if the dogs are not sufficiently adapted to that environment, they perish, and they're not able to pass on their traits. And so sure enough, dogs have traits that are well-suited to their environment. If they didn't, they wouldn't be there. They'd be dead. And there are some traits that are kind of neutral with respect to survival, like eye collar doesn't have a lot to do with survival. And so it just happens to be which where the animals went that had, with the dogs that had the blue eyes versus the brown and so on. That's called genetic drift. It's kind of like natural selection, but there, it, it, there's, no, there's no survival effect. But sure enough, uh, we find that dogs in the cold climates have the longer, thicker fur. Dogs in the hot climates, in the wild, dogs in the wild. Uh, this is natural selection at work. It's a great example of natural selection. It's based on the information that God put in the original DNA of these dogs and then how, as they reproduce, just the different combinations that fall out of that. But, it's, but it can't possibly drive evolution because there's no new information. Now, evolutionists will say, but it's not just natural selection, it's natural selection and mutation. So we gotta talk about mutation. So mutation, you can think of it as a typo in your DNA. That's what it is, it's a mistake in your DNA. And sometimes that happens in the process of the DNA being copied. So when that copying process happens, sometimes it's not copied correctly. Now, usually it is, but every now and then a mistake is made. And by the way, you have a built-in spell checker in your DNA, which is just amazing. You have, you have mechanisms in your DNA that can correct about 999 out of 1,000 mutations. 
Praise God for that. That's amazing. But we live in a fallen world. And so every now and then one gets through. And when mistakes are in your genome, that means the proteins don't form right and therefore the structure that they make doesn't form right. All dogs should have information to produce four normal healthy legs. There is a mutation that causes a dog to have short stubby little legs because they don't form at the right length, okay? And if you think about it, a dog like that one on the right there, that's not, he's not gonna do so well in the wild, is he? On those short stubby le little legs, he can't run very fast, he can't catch anything, he's more likely to be caught by something else. So he's not gonna survive in the wild. And so we, we find that uh, mutations are held at bay to some extent in nature because organisms that have them have this nasty tendency to die. Uh, there are some mutations that are immediately fatal. There are some mutations that cause the heart not to form properly. You're not gonna pass that on because you're dead, right? But there are some mutations that are just kind of inconvenient and the organism might be able to survive and pass that on but um, they, they tend to accumulate with time and eventually uh, the organism uh, goes extinct. That's one way they can go extinct. So anyway, so in, in nature, mutations, some of them are eliminated because it kills the organism or the organism is not sufficiently adjusted to that environment to survive. But some people like dogs with short stubby little legs because they can't really jump up on you as much. And so people will take dogs with short stubby little legs and take them into their home and take care of them and that little dog doesn't have to survive in the wild because he has a human caretaker to take care of him. Pretty neat. And so you'll find that domestic breeds of dogs are full of mutations. They are. Because they don't have to survive in the wild. They have a human slave, uh, caretaker to take care of them, right? To spend millions of dollars trying to keep them alive because they're missing some instructions. And so there are all kinds of mutations in domestic dogs. There's a mutation that causes a dog's snout not to form properly. Dogs are supposed to have a long snout and that helps with their ability to uh, smell and so on. There's a mutation that causes the snout to be short, but the jaw was designed to fit the longer snout so they have a horrible underbite. And then the skin was designed to fit the longer snout so the skin hangs off the side. And, and some people think that's cute. You think the dog says, gee, I love having my nose stuffed into my face. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. He probably doesn't like those mutations so much. But some people like them, and it's fine. Poodles, for example. Poodles have some problems. They're very cute, but they do have some diseases because of the mutations that have accumulated in their genome. And these are some of the diseases they can get, either as a direct result of a mutation or as a secondary result. For example, one of the mutations that a poodle has, a, do a, a dog's hair is supposed to grow so long and then it stops and it falls out and it's replaced and that regulates the hair growth. Like the short and long genes we talked about previously. In the poodle, that gene is damaged. And so the poodle's hair grows forever. It grows indefinitely. Which is why if you have a poodle, you have to give it a haircut every now and then. Otherwise you'd end up with a big poof ball, right? Now there's no way that animal could survive in the wild. You will never see a National Geographic special. You know, the mighty poodle stalks his prey. No, <laughs> not gonna happen. If you, if you see a poodle, it has a human caretaker because that hair would get, so, you know, and by the way, even if, if you're negligent, the hair can get in its eyes and it can go blind. Poodles get that a lot or it can get in their ears. Their ears can get infected. It can even kill them. And so you do have to spend quite a bit of money to try and keep these poor little things alive because they're missing some instructions. Now, is this evolution? Have we gained any new information? No, we've lost information and, it's, and it causes them problems. So this is not a dog evolving into something better. It's, this is a dog devolving, really. It's the opposite of evolution, right? So this is how we account for the different breeds of domestic dogs in the world. It's the information God put in there and mutations, mistakes that have crept in that cause little problems, and that's why domestic dogs tend to be full of mutations. They don't have to survive in the wild. They have a human caretaker who will compensate for their mutations by, by taking care of them. Now, this is not evolution because it's in the wrong direction. You see, the dogs that were on Noah's Ark, we think were probably similar to the wolf variety. Wolves still have a lot of what we call heterozygosity, big A, little a, big B, little b. And so as they were selectively um, breeded together, and that's what inbreeding does. Inbreeding concentrates the mutations, and so you're more likely to end up with the disease. That's why purebred dogs, tend to, they tend to have more diseases. The mutt that you run over, they get up and wave and run off, right? But purebred, you know, you, you look at them the wrong way, and you've got to get the paddles out and restart their art. But um, so, especially once you get down to the poodle, because this is, not, this is not gaining new information. You're losing it. 
And so, and the poodle's just kind of the last step there. So that's kind of the bottom line of the, the dog world. You really can't get below that, really. So that's it. So theoretically, you could take two wolves, and by selectively breeding them and selecting the offspring, theoretically, you could get down to a poodle again. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could. Now, but you could never take two poodles and get back to the wolf. You could never do that. The only thing poodles will ever produce is poodles. They can't produce other breeds because they have homozygosity. They're, it's big A, big A. Little B, little B. Same. And that's the nice thing about purebreds. You, you have purebreds, you get, their offspring will look almost identical to them. And the bad thing is their offspring will look identical to them. Okay? Because you've lost that heterozygosity. When I'm explaining this to kids, I say the, the different combinations of information in your genome, you can think of it like jelly beans. And so the wild kinds of dogs, lots of jelly beans, lots of information in their DNA. And then you get down to the poodle, and that's kind of it. Yes, that's kind of the bare minimum information that you need to make a dog. That's it. Now, and you, you, know, you remove that. It's, that's it. It's over. Now, could you ever turn a dog into a cat by removing jelly beans? And the answer is no, because a cat doesn't have jelly beans. He's got Jolly Ranchers. He's got different instructions, you see, in his DNA. Cats have different instructions. Now, again, some of them are the same because we use some of the same proteins. That's important. But many of them are different. You can never turn one kind of organism into another by removing that information. You'd have to add brand new instructions, and natural selection and mutations don't do that. And so when we take a look at dogs and we see how dogs reproduce, you know what we find? Dogs reproduce dogs. And this is good observational science. It's testable and repeatable in the present, and it's consistent with biblical creation. God made the original kinds. He made them according to their kinds, and they reproduce that way. The dogs reproduce dogs. Cats reproduce cats, humans reproduce humans. It's consistent with science. I do have to point out that mutations can sometimes be beneficial. There are mutations that can help an organism survive, but they're still not evolution because they're in the opposite direction. Evolution is about increasing the information in your DNA. Mutations remove it. They scramble that information. So as one example, antibiotic resistance. Sometimes evolutionists will say, here, here you go, bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. That's evolution in action. No, it's not, because there's no new information. Let me show you how it works. There's a few different ways this can happen, but they all involve uh, loss mutations. There's a bacterium called H. pylori, which causes stomach ulcers, and that's unpleasant. And so you go to your doctor, and he gives you an antibiotic. The antibiotic, um, which your, your body can't really process it. It's kind of inert. It just goes into your body and goes through it. But the bacterium, when, it, when the antibiotic goes into the bacterium, he's got an enzyme in him that reacts with that antibiotic and converts it into a poison. And the poison kills the bacterium. Pretty neat. And you feel better. You say, thank you, doctor. There is a mutated form of H. pylori that lacks the ability to produce that enzyme in, in great quantities. And so when the antibiotic goes into him, it just sits there. He lacks the ability to convert it into a poison because he's missing that enzyme. And so he survives, but he survives because he's lost some instructions. That can happen. Okay, and so that's a resistant strain, which is why you need to take all of your antibiotic even when you start to feel better. You've killed off all the normal bacteria, and the only ones that are left are the ones that are resistant. And eventually the antibiotic will kill them too. They have a little bit of that enzyme. But if you don't, then, then the mutated ones survive and reproduce, and now you have a resistant strain, and the antibiotic won't work as well next time. So that's why you do that. So anyway, this is a great example of adaptation, because so, these bacteria have adapted to a situation with antibiotics, not because they're reprogramming themselves, not because they've seen some environmental challenge and have decided, I'm going to reprogram my DNA. They don't have the ability to do that, but some of them already had that mistake, and it made them resistant, and so those are the ones that reproduce. So there you go. But point mutations, these little mistakes, these little typos in your DNA, all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. Mutations are always in the opposite direction of evolution, according to Dr. Lee Spetner, who's a PhD biophysicist at Johns Hopkins University. He says, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Now, if I were an evolutionist, I would lose sleep over that. Because in the evolutionary view, we are made of mutation increasing mutations, or information increasing mutations, right? That's how we got from bacteria to us, is the accumulation of new information as mutations produced it. But we haven't observed even one. So when I say evolution is scientifically bankrupt, I mean it. 
There's no, there's no observational evidence of it. It doesn't happen. It's consistent with creation. So when we take a look at DNA, we find that DNA is copied and occasionally instructions are lost, but they're not gained. We don't gain brand new information in our DNA from mutations. And that's consistent with creation and curse because we live in a cursed world and that's why these mutations can occur now. So it's not consistent with evolution. Well, we've been talking about information. There's actually a whole branch of science that deals with information, information theory, how information is transmitted and so on. It's really exciting these days because, of course, uh, with the, the computer technology, it's, computers are all information-based. And uh, Dr. Werner Gitt is one of the world's experts on information theory. And he's a, a very solid Christian and a creationist and, um, and a good friend. He's a very neat guy. But it, uh, Dr. Gitt pointed out that information always entails certain properties. And I'm kind of... I'm kind of summarizing what he, uh, what he wrote. Information, what is it? Well, it always involves a symbolic code system. And so if I pick up a book and I open up uh, and I see the word house there, I'm not seeing a house, I'm seeing a word that represents a house. The house is the referent, the word is the verbal token. That's a symbolic code system. Words represent objects or actions or ideas, right? So words are symbolic. They are. They represent something else. So it's got a symbolic code system. There's always language. Uh, it, it, when I read a book, it's not just a random assemblage of words. The words are organized into sentences. And, and you, have a, you, know, you have a noun, you have a verb, you have a subject and a predicate and so on. So there's a language convention. Different languages have different rules, but there's always a language there. And then finally, information always has meaning. There's, a, there's an expected action on the part of the recipient of the information and an intended purpose. There's a, there's a reason why that information was sent. And so let's, let's take a cookbook, for example. Does a cookbook have information in it? Yeah, because it, it fulfills all those three criteria. It's got a symbolic code system. It says mix, that, that's an action, right? Three tablespoons of sugar, and that, so that's the symbols, right? And then there's a language convention. If I'm looking at it, it's English, okay? Because that's what I read. And then there's an expected action. The expected action is that I will combine the ingredients in the way that the book specifies. And there's an intended purpose so that I won't go hungry. So a cookbook fulfills all those criteria. Pretty neat, okay? And any book that you pick up is gonna fulfill those three criteria. Books have information in them because they have a symbolic code system, language, and they're meaningful. It's expected that you will do something and there's a reason for it. I can learn something by reading that information. So let's, let's, um, let's see if we've got it. Let's, let's uh, test our information detection skills. Could this be information? It looks like it could be, right? It looks like there's the code system there. There's, there's little icons, and those seem to represent something. It, it, and they're organized into what looks like sentences. So it looks like there's a language convention there as well. So we've got a code system, and we've got language, but is there meaning? Is there meaning? And it turns out there is. And the only way you can know that is if you know what the code system is. And I happen to know this code. This is Genesis 1, 1 through 5 in the form of icons. You see, in the beginning, the clipboard, like a movie clipboard, like in the beginning of a movie, uh, God created heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, right? And God said... Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. Isn't that cute? Yeah. So that's Genesis 1, 1 through 5 in the form of icons. So there is information there, because you've got a symbolic code system in the form of icons. You've got language. It's organized into sentences. And there's meaning. It's telling you how God created the universe. The expected action is that I will repent and, and trust in Christ, right? So that's the purpose of Scripture, ultimately, is that I'll have eternal life. Now, once you have identified information, there are certain laws that apply. Just like when you have energy, there are laws that apply to energy, like the law of conservation of energy, which says you can't create or destroy energy, you can only transform it. Likewise, there are laws of information. And Dr. Werner Gitt has uh, expanded on those and written about them. For example, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. So what Dr. Gitt is saying there is that if you have information, it can't just spontaneously accumulate in matter. And what that means is if you have a, a box of or, or a bowl of alphabet soup and you stir it up, don't expect to get Shakespeare. Because it's not, it, that information is not going to just spontaneously arise in matter. It never does, according to Dr. Gitt. 
So where does it come from? Where does information come from? A mind. Dr. Gitz says, when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. So information always originates, always originates in a mind. Now, it can be copied by non-mental processes. A computer can copy information. It can copy files, right? But it can't create brand new information. It's got, there's got to be a programmer there. Or um, a, a Xerox machine can copy information, but it can't write a book, okay? Human beings, minds produce brand new information. And, uh, and that makes sense. We, we'd expect that, right? If, um, if you picked up a book, not one of you would assume, well, I suppose this probably came about by an explosion in a typewriter. If that book has information in it, you would assume it came from a mind, wouldn't you? Now, that doesn't mean the machine that printed it has a mind. It's probably mindless, but it got its information from another machine, which got its information from a computer, which got its information from a human programmer. Okay? So information always comes from a mind, and that's obvious. And yet, what do we have in DNA? Information. All the information to make you is in your DNA. Now, where did that ultimately come from? It had to come from a mind. See, evolution's inconsistent with that. Now, the process of copying DNA doesn't have to have a mind, okay? Bacteria can replicate their own DNA. It's all chemical-based, but they can't produce new information in their DNA because they don't have a mind. So you see, the, the fact that we have information in our DNA, you got your information from your parents, they got it from their parents, they got it from their parents, back to Adam and Eve, they got it from God, the mind of God. Creation is consistent with the laws of information. Evolution is not. In the evolutionary view, all the information in our DNA came about by chance, not by a mind. Mindless mutations, which we have never observed, and which violates the laws of information theory. So which one's good science? It's not evolution. It's creation that's consistent with science. And by the way, I know that in their heart of hearts, evolutionists know that information always comes from a mind. They do. They just suppress that truth and unrighteousness. I did a little social experiment a few years ago. This was fun. I posted this article called On the Origin of Articles. And the article is supposed to convince, it's a satire. The article is supposed to convince you that articles have no authors, but have come about through, through a gradual evolutionary process, a collection of typos, basically, most of which make the article worse, but occasionally a typo makes the article better and it's more likely to be copied. And so articles, probably, they probably started out as a single letter millions of years ago, and as that letter was copied and replicated, more were added, and eventually you get these wonderful articles. And so the article tries to convince you that articles have no authors and that if you believe that articles have authors, you're just a superstitious idiot, basically. <laughs> And it was, it was fun. It was fun to post this. And the, thing, it was not so, the funny thing was not so much the article, but the responses that I got to it. You see, I used to allow people to comment on the website. I had to put a stop to that because some evolutionists really started getting just nasty. But um, I allowed evolutionists to get on there. And they, we know you wrote this, Dr. Lyle. I'm like, how, did you, how do you know that? Did you see me write it? No? Oh, you're taking that on faith? Oh, that's interesting. It says, well, it says posted by you. Hey, I admit to posting it. When this thing evolved on my computer, it was too good not to share it, right? <laughs> Besides, do you believe everything you read? The Bible says it's written by God. Do you believe that? Oh, inconsistent, <laughs> right? You must be one of those authorists that believe the articles have authors. I mean, if you want to believe that, fine, but keep it in church, man, right? <laughs> don't, don't teach that stuff to my kids. Anyway, it was really funny, and I, was, and, I, and I would play the part of the, of the evolutionist and defend the idea that this article, which I had written, has no author. And it was so funny. In fact, I even demanded of the author. I said, in fact, if there's an author, let him show himself in this article right now, and then I'll believe. <laughs> I used every trick that they used. And you know what? They couldn't refute me. Now, they could, they could have easily. All they'd have to do to prove that I or somebody wrote that is say, well, we know that that article has an author because it has information and information comes from a mind. Not one of them used that argument. Why? Because they'd have to give up evolution. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? People would rather be reduced to absurdity than give up evolution. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that fascinating? The whole SETI project, which is listening for these alien, you know, signals from outer space, they haven't found any. I don't think they will. But... You know, there's lots of radio transmissions from space. The sun gives off radio, 
It sounds like static. I've listened to it. It's not pleasant. There are other stars. There are stars called pulsars that emit this pip, 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 pip radio signal. And uh, in fact, when pulsars were first discovered, they labeled them L, um, LGM, LGMs, which stands for Little Green Men. Yeah. <laughs> they're not. They're a, they're, a, they're a rotating collapsed star, and that's what causes the radio pulses. But with all these natural radio signals, how would you distinguish an intelligent, a, a transmission from an intelligent species out in space? Not that I think there are any, but how would you distinguish that? The answer is, it would have information in it. If we got instructions from space on how to build a warp drive, and, and we built it and it worked, we'd say, I, I'd be convinced there's, that it was sent by an intelligence. Not necessarily aliens, but I would be convinced that it was sent by an intelligence. Why? Because information always comes from a mind. The whole SETI program is founded on that. And yet those same scientists, when they look through a microscope and they see the copious amount of information in DNA, say, oh, that must have come about by chance. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And there are, don't get me wrong, there are people that are more intelligent, smarter than I am, that are evolutionists. But if they're not using their mind properly, they've been reduced to a foolish worldview. Right? If they've rejected God, they've been reduced to a foolish worldview. Well, let's move on and talk about geology. I'll have to, I want to spend the remaining time on this. I think the first myth that we have to blow up is that these rocks are millions, if not billions, of years old. And we hear that, we hear about radiometric dating, that, that scientists can somehow date these rocks. And they know they're billions of years old because of radiometric dating. And I want to show you how that method is supposed to work and why it really doesn't. Uh, so we're all made up of atoms, these little particles that have, elect they have um, electrons circling around the nucleus. The nucleus has protons and neutrons that you see there. I've got the protons in red, the neutrons in white, the electrons in blue circling around. And the, um, we're made up of mostly the lighter atoms, but there are some heavier atoms, like uranium, that are unstable. And what unstable or, or radioactive, what that means is it will spontaneously change into another type of atom. It does happen. It's like alchemy, but, but you, you have no control over it. It does it by itself. So uranium-238, for example. Uranium-238 is unstable or radioactive. It will spontaneously decay or change into thorium. And it gives off energy when it does that. And radios can detect that energy, hence radioactive. Okay? So it, it, it changes into thorium, which changes into the next one. So those are all unstable until it gets all the way down to lead 206. Lead 206 is stable. So once it's lead 206, it's perfectly happy to remain lead 206 forever. Now this happens one atom at a time. And you don't know which atom is going to go next. You could, you could, you could, if I had a chunk of solid uranium 238, atom by atom, they would be changing into thorium which would then be changing into the next one, into the next one, and so on, okay? It's kind of like popcorn. You don't know which kernel's going to pop next, but you do know that after about two and a half minutes, they popped, right? If they're going to pop, they popped. And so it's the same way with uranium-238. We don't know when the next atom's going to pop, but we don't know. If you have enough atoms, we know that statistically, after a certain amount of time, half of them will have changed into lead. And for uranium, it's a very slow reaction. For half of it to change to lead, it would take billions of years, theoretically. What we do is we measure it over a few years, and we see the small percentage that's changed, and then we ex extrapolate. Okay? So it's slow for uranium. And there's other elements, too, that'll do this. Uh, there's a certain form of potassium that is unstable, and it will, de it will decay into argon, which is a gas. So the bottom line is if I had a chunk of solid uranium, and I waited long enough, eventually it would be uranium and lead, along with the intermediate elements. And if I waited long enough, eventually it'd be 100% lead. You don't have to do anything. This happens all by itself in nature. Now, fortunately, only a small fraction of atoms do this. Okay, so you're not going to change into anything else in the next 24 hours. But uranium does that, and it's a slow process. And so the idea is, since we know the rate at which that happens, we can use it like a clock. And that's pretty clever. And so if I find a rock that's got some uranium and some lead in it, Knowing the rate at which uranium changes to lead, I could work the equation backwards and figure out when it was all uranium, right? But how do I know it started all uranium? How do I know it didn't start with some lead in it to begin with? And by the way, secularists do not assume that the rock was all uranium to begin with. They assume it had some lead in it to begin with. But how much lead do I start with? If you tell me how old you want the rock to be, I'll tell you how much lead it started with. See the issue there? And it is an issue. And, and don't get me wrong, secularists are not stupid. They have ways to try and get around that. But that is an assumption that they have to make, is that they know the initial ratio of the parent to daughter product, the uranium to lead, that it started with. 
Um, you can think of it, you can think of the uranium changing to lead like sand going from the top chamber to the bottom chamber in an hourglass. And you can use an hourglass to tell time. If when you came into this room, you saw the hourglass like that, I said, how long ago did I turn that over, you think? And you say, well, it's about halfway through. It's an hourglass. I'm going to say 30 minutes, half an hour. And I say, you're wrong. I turned it over one minute ago. But already a lot of the sand was in the bottom chamber, you see. You assumed that all the sand started in the top chamber. You can't assume that. You can't assume that. It, we, we don't know when I turned it over. It might have been on its side, and a lot of it maybe half, you know, it's kind of already halfway through like that. How do you know that somebody didn't add sand when you're not looking? Now, uranium is leachable in salt water. It can move in and out of the rocks under the, under the right circumstances. Or how do you know the throat of the bottle has always been the same size? The idea that the sand has always flown through at the same rate that it does today. Now, that's probably a pr pretty realistic, a safe assumption for an hourglass. But we don't know why radioactive decay happens at the rate that it does. And therefore, we don't know that it's been constant throughout history. And in fact, we now know that it can be accelerated. There are certain kinds of radioactive decay that we've been able to speed up in a laboratory by a factor of a billion. We can make it decay a billion times, the rhenium-osmium reaction, we can make it decay a billion times faster just by ionizing the atom. That's amazing. And if we can do it, obviously God can do it, and God could use methods that, that are supernatural that we can't use. But the bottom line is, radiometric dating assumes that you know the initial ratio of parent to daughter product, the initial conditions are known, that the decay rate has always been constant in what it is today, and that the system is closed, that, you, that minerals have not moved in and out of the system, okay? And we now have good evidence that number two is wrong. And in some cases, number one is wrong, but in many cases, number two is wrong. The, the, uh, there was a uh, research project done by a number of creationists, creation scientists in collaboration, PhDs in geology and physics and so on, and they found very compelling evidence. I'm convinced number two is false. The decay rate is not constant. It, it was much faster in the past. And uh, you can ask me about that later if you want. I'm happy to talk about that. It's, it was fantastic research, very well done. But the bottom line is we know radiometric dating is not accurate because we can test it on rocks whose age we know. You see, radiometric dating is supposed to tell you, it only works on igneous rocks, rocks that are volcanic in nature, that have hardened from magma or lava, okay? And that sets the zero point. Because when it's magma, the minerals can move in and out. It's liquid. But once it hardens in a rock, that's supposed to trap the elements in there, the argon and so on. Um, and so we tested it with brand new rocks that were produced in the Mount St. Helens eruptions, which began in 1980. There were several eruptions. And we took these brand new rocks, that had formed from the magma, and we sent them in and had them radiometrically dated, which is a stupid thing to do normally because it's expensive to radiometrically date rocks, and we know the age, the age is zero, it's brand new. But we wanted to test the method, you see. And they came back with ages of hundreds of thousands to millions of years on rocks that we know are brand new. You see, that's an isolated incident, it's not. We've done that with rocks from Hawaii as well. You can take, you can take a pull and stick it in the magma, watch the rock harden, send it in, you'll get millions of years. They'll tell you it's millions of years old, even though you watched it form. Radiometric dating has been demonstrated to not work on rocks of known age. Secularists assume that it works on rocks of unknown age. That's the bottom line, and I don't think that's logical. I feel like if I gave you a calculator, Merry Christmas, seven plus seven equals 57,213? Don't worry, it works on big numbers. I don't think I trust that. If I can't trust it on small matters, why can I trust it, you know? It's funny because evolutionists, they'll admit, they'll admit that radiometric dating sometimes fails and they'll give the explanation and sometimes it's plausible. They'll say, well, there's excess argon in those rocks. Okay, that's a, good ex that's a good reason why this doesn't work. But how do you know it works for these other rocks? How do you know they didn't have excess argon in them? You don't, right? So that's the bottom line. We know radiometric dating doesn't work because it gives wrong ages on rocks of known age. Now sometimes it'll give the right answer. Sometimes it'll give a negative age, depending on the method that's used. So I think that's funny. You can hold in your hand a rock that according to radiometric dating will not form for another million years. The isochron methods sometimes give a negative age. Anyway, what about carbon dating? A lot, of a lot of times people confuse these other radiometric dating methods with carbon dating. Carbon dating's similar, but carbon dating's better because when we test it on things of known age, it tends to give within the ballpark of the right answer. So we have a little more confidence in it. 
and also because we think the, uh, the decay rate of C14, which is much more rapid, C14 has a half-life of 5,700 years, not millions of years. And so we think when these, when these rates were accelerated, it didn't affect the carbon dating too much. It might have been a little bit, but not much. The way it works, most carbon is C12. It's got six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus, okay? And that's stable. C12 will remain C12 forever. There is a variety of, C, of carbon, C14, that has two extra neutrons, and that makes it unstable. It would, like to, it would really rather be nitrogen, and it will spontaneously convert into nitrogen and emit energy as it does so. Uh, the C14 is produced in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays bombard nitrogen atoms, converting the C14, and then within 5,700 years, half of those will have decayed back to nitrogen. That's how it works. So a small fraction of the carbon in the atmosphere, of this, uh, there's some carbon dioxide in this room, and a small fraction of those carbon atoms, about one in a trillion, is C14 instead of C12. And what happens is the plants, they take in that, that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they use the carbon to build themselves. Pretty neat, and that becomes food for us, right? Which means a small fraction of plants are C14. And then we eat the plants, or the animals eat the plants, and we eat the animals, and that C14 goes into us. So all of you have a little C14 in you. You're all slightly unstable. How about that? Okay? Now, why, yeah, it does. Now, while you're alive, while you're alive, um, you, you continue to eat new food. Now, that C14 is constantly decaying back into nitrogen, but it's, sl it's slow. It takes 5,700 years for it to do that. But when you're alive, you replace it because you're eating more food and you're replacing that C14. So when you're alive, the C14 to C12 ratio in you is about the same as it is in the atmosphere, roughly. But then when you die, you don't breathe anymore and you don't eat any new food. And so the C14 is no longer replaced, it just decays away. Okay, so when you're alive, the C14 to C12 is the same as in the environment up until the moment of your death and then the C14 is, can no longer be replaced, so it simply decays away and if anything were even one million years old, there would be zero C14 in it. Because with a half-life of 5,700 years, you run that out a million years, there, there'd be no, there would be not one atom of C14 left in anything. So anything that has C14 in it, that's, unless it's exposed to the upper atmosphere where it can, where it can be recharged, anything that's down here, um, if it has C14 in it, that means it can't be millions of years old. And that's cool because everything we've tested that has carbon in it has C14 in it. Chunks of coal, you can take a chunk of coal, it'll have C14 in it. Now, coal beds are supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old. They should have zero C14 in them. They used to use coal to calibrate the machines under the assumption that there should be zero C14 in coal. They don't do that anymore. Because we now know that coal has C14 in it, every chunk we've ever tested. Dinosaur remains, if there's enough collagen left in them, you can carbon date them. We, get, we find C14 in them. They're not millions of years old. Diamonds. We found C14 in diamonds, and that proves they're not billions of years old. It just can't last that long. And the, the, the evolutionists love to say, well, there's been some contamination. You know, some, some new C14 has got in there. It's a diamond. It's the hardest substance. How are you going to get new C14 in there? These are buried deep down in the earth, insulated from cosmic rays. There's no way to produce new C14 down there. Other radiometric decay is insufficient to recharge something as, as, as fast as the C14 decay in terms of the, the secular time scale. And there are hundreds of processes like that. We tend not to hear about these because they go against the narrative. But there are all kinds of processes. Now, some of these are stronger than others, I admit that. But some of these I find very, I think the C14 is very strong. The fact that we find it in everything, that's amazing. That would really bother me if I believed in the millions of years. But as a biblical creationist, I can say, yeah, that's what I'd expect. That's what I'd expect. Lots of processes like that. The rate at which salt flows into the ocean. You know, the oceans get a little saltier every year. Because fr even, even fresh water has a little bit of salt in it. It picks it up from the land, dumps it into the ocean. The water evaporates, but it leaves the salt. And so oceans get saltier and saltier every year. We can run the math backwards. Even being generous to the critics, the maximum possible age of the ocean, 62 million years. Because at that point, it would have zero salt you can't have less salt than no salt, right? So that's an upper limit on the age. That's not the true age, that's an upper limit on the age. It can't be older than that. And so that's consistent with the biblical age of 6,000 years, because that's less than the upper limit of 62 million, but it's not consistent with the secular age, which is supposed to be 3 billion years old. A lot of stuff like that, the rate at which mud accumulates. Um, you can get the current amount of mud on the ocean floor in less than 12 million years. 
And that's assuming there was no worldwide flood, which would dump a lot of mud very quickly, right? So that's inconsistent with the billions of years. A lot of stuff like that. Human population. How long does it take to get Earth's current population of about, what, 7 billion humans? It doesn't take millions of years. It's very difficult to keep a population a growth rate exactly zero. It's certainly not for millions of years. It's very consistent with the biblical time scale. We know that from recorded history. But the best evidence that the world's thousands of years old, we have the birth certificate of the universe. That's the best evidence. We have the word of God. God tells us that. The secular scientists say the earth's billions of years old. Take my word for it. God says I created in six days. Take my word for it. My point is the science is consistent with what God's word teaches. The millions of years is wishful thinking on the part of evolutionists. Well, what about these fossils? Because I was always given the impression that, well, don't fossils take millions of years to form? Here's a fossil ichthyosaur. That's a marine reptile. As far as we know, they're extinct. Um, they're found in the same kind of layers that are associated with dinosaurs. So the evolutionists think it's been extinct for millions of years. This thing was killed, buried, and fossilized in the process of giving birth. You see the baby ichthyosaur being born there? They're born tail first because they're air breathers. I'd like to know how that evolved. Think about that, right? Because as soon as they're born, they have to swim to the surface and get their first breath of air. So if they were born head first, they'd drown before they ever got, so God turned them around. How would evolution do that? That's something to think about. Here's a fish eating another fish, fossilized in that process. I don't think that took millions of years. Obviously, those were killed quickly and buried, and then the fossilization didn't, it didn't take that long. See, most things don't become a fossil. When, when an organism dies, let's say you got your dead cat there, and you're going to watch it slowly fossilize over millions of years. Okay, we'll do a little scientific experiment here. You come back in a few days, it just smells bad. You come back a few more days, it really smells bad. You come back a few more days, part of it's missing. You come back a few more days, more of it's missing, and eventually all of it's missing. Animals do not normally just slowly turn into fossils. They are recycled back into their environment. You've seen animals that have been killed and left on the side of the road. They don't turn into statues. They are recycled back into their environment. In order to fossilize something, you have to bury it to isolate it from the environment so it can't pick, get picked off by scavengers and decay. And even then I was given the wrong impression. I was told the fish dies, it sinks down to the bottom, it's slowly covered up over millions of years. Well, no, wait a minute. If this layer happened a million years after that layer, the top of the fish would have had plenty of time to decay. Scavengers would have picked it apart, right? You'd have to bury it rapidly. And most fish don't sink to the bottom when they die. Most fish float anyway. In any case, they're picked off by scavengers. If you've seen those, those um, Discovery Channel or National Ge Geographic specials where they show the bottom of the ocean, you don't see billions of dead fish waiting to fossilize. That's not what you see. So how do you form a fossil fish? Well, it turns out flood conditions are the way to do it. You mean fish can be killed in a flood if it's a violent one because it'll dump sediment on them. So if you really want to form a fossil fish, here's how you do it. You go home to your aquarium. I don't know. This is still legal in Texas. I don't know about here. And you dump some concrete on. Okay? I know. It's, it's a fish. It's not a dog. Come on. And that's going to kill that fish, of course. And usually there's enough bacteria left that they can eat away at the soft stuff. But by the time the bones are exposed, the minerals will move in and fill in all the holes in the bone. And you end up with a stone in the shape of a bone. That's how you form a fossil. Scientists have been able to do this in a lab in a matter of weeks. It doesn't take millions of years to form fossils. It doesn't take millions of years. Somewhere I've seen a fossil hat. I used to have it in this presentation. Maybe I forgot it. A fossil hat. It used to be a soft hat, and now it's a hard hat because it, it mineralized. They dropped it in a well that had a lot of uh, uh, concretions in the water. Fossilized. What about the kinds of fossils we find? Because I was always taught, oh, they support evolution. There's the evolution of the horse. I'm thinking, well, I see lots of horses, but where's the non-horse becoming a horse? Because really all of these, with the exception of the last one there, which we think is actually a rock badger, and if you say, why does that look like a horse? Because somebody was told that's the ancestor of a horse. Draw what you think it looked like. There's a difference between evidence and artwork. The rest of these are horses. You say, but the toes were a little different. Modern horse has only the single toe, and so did that one, but these ones have three. Okay. Some dogs have short fur, some dogs have long fur. Some varieties are, go extinct. These varieties are extinct today. They're still horses. 
but they're different sizes. We got horses of different sizes today. These are both adult horses. They're just different breeds. Lots of different varieties of horse. Why, should, why would we expect that all of them have survived until today? Some of them have gone extinct. What we don't see is one kind changing another. And by the way, just about every example you'll see in the evolutionist's own textbooks of evolution is variation within a kind. It's exactly what the creationists would expect. You don't see one basic kind becoming another. You don't find it. But don't rocks take millions of years to form? The rocks in which we find these fossils, those take millions of years, right? Here's a set of car keys embedded inside solid rock. I don't think that took millions of years to form. Here's a man-made mechanical clock embedded inside solid rock. That's the one rock we know exactly what time it happened. Well, all these rock layers. There's a person down there for scale. Surely those took millions and millions of years to, to be deposited. Look how many there are. Those, were, um, those did not exist before 1980. Those were formed in the Mount St. Helens eruptions. Not all of them are rock. Some of them are unconsolidated sediment. Some of them are rock. But that's, it doesn't take millions of years. It just takes the right conditions. Catastrophic conditions will do it. Flood conditions will do it. Mount St. Helens demonstrated that a lot of the things that biblical creationists say can happen quickly can, in fact, happen quickly. Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, it, carved, it, it splashed a, a wave in Spirit Lake and cut a canyon 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon in a matter of hours. It doesn't take millions of years to form a canyon. That canyon didn't exist before 1980. It wasn't there. And we find very fine laminations in these, some of the rock layers that it deposits, some of the sediment layers. And those are the same kind of laminations you see in the Grand Canyon. And they used to say those are annual layers. Each one of those is one year after the next. You add them up, millions of layers, therefore millions of years. Except we now know those aren't annual. Those were all deposited in that Mount St. Helens eruption. They were, they were, they're simultaneous. They had to do with the way the mud flows. And that's the same kind of laminations you find in the Tapete Sandstone, which covers much of the United States and Canada, that formation anyway. It's given different names in different parts of the world, but it's the same layer. Think of the catastrophe that would deposit something on that scale. And most of the rock layers, by the way, between, um, uh, from the Cambrian all the way up until at least the, um, uh, at least up until the tertiary, they tend to be continental in scale. That's not happening today. We don't, we're, we don't have floods today on a continental scale, but there was a time when we did. It was during the worldwide flood. We find trees buried vertically without roots with bits of coal at their base. Now, I was taught that coal forms in swamps over millions of years as peat accumulates and gradually turns into coal. Is that the lesson you were taught? That's what I was taught in the public school system. But you know what? We sometimes find impressions of leaves in the coal, and they are not leaves from plants that grow in swamps. They are leaves from plants that grow in mountain rainforests. You mean the, the coal actually formed in a mountain rainforest? Yes when trees were rapidly uprooted and some of them were compressed into coal. But what about the roots? If trees buried vertically with no roots, how does that happen? Mount St. Helens showed us. Because when it, when it erupted, it uprooted trees like matchsticks. I've seen videos of it. It's extraordinary. It is spectacular. And, and there was a lake nearby, Spirit Lake. And many of those trees, having been uprooted, they tended to float in Spirit Lake. And most of them floated vertically because of the little remnants of the root that's at the base. Until they became waterlogged and sagged it down we know how this happens now. We've seen it. It was a catastrophe and flood conditions that did it. So you see, when we see these rock layers, it really is very compelling evidence of a worldwide flood. And this is good observational science. We could, Mount St. Helens demonstrated that a lot of these things that evolutionists say take millions of years do not, in fact, take millions of years. They just take catastrophic conditions. And Mount St. Helens was one rather piddly volcano by volcano standards. When the great flood happened, the Bible says all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. That might refer to underwater volcanoes, all of them going off at the same time. That's a catastrophe. You see, it's consistent with the global flood. It's not consistent with the millions of years. And so when you see these, when you see, you know, you see these rock layers, and I don't, know if, I don't know if you have them around here or not, but in, I, like growing up in Ohio, there were sections, I'm kind of in the Rolling Hills district, there are sections where they will cut through the hill and you can see the rock layers there and you can see the, the sedimentation. And you know, you're taught, well, that's millions of years. It's not, it's evidence of a worldwide flood. It's evidence that God judges sin. That's why we find all these billions of fossils all around the world. It's not evidence for evolution, it's evidence that God is righteous. The real message of the rocks is repent. 
That's the real message. And the Bible predicted that people would deny that. In the last days, there would come those who would deny the worldwide flood. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were revolved and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. It says they willfully forget that. They're deliberately ignorant. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. God is righteous and therefore he'll judge sin. But he's also merciful and he provided a way of escape. He's, pr he's promised to pay our penalty on the cross. And that is awesome. And just as, he, just as during the days of Noah, God prepared a way of escape. And of the billions of people, and there could have been billions of people on the earth at the time of the flood. We, we don't know the exact number. But, if, but people lived very long and they reproduced a lot of offspring. You do the math. There could have been billions of people, theoretically. But of those people, eight responded to God's message of salvation and grace. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Come on board the ark and be saved. Eight were. And then God closed the door, which I think is significant. God was the one that decided time of mercy is over. Time of judgment is now. And so you see, we can use science to point people to the gospel. We can say, you know, the, the Bible is true from the beginning. All the evidence indicates creation, information from genetics, information theory, uh, fossils, rock layers. They're all consistent with, with what the Bible teaches. And therefore, its message of salvation can be trusted as well. It really is the word of God. And it should remind us that, yes, God's going to judge the world again globally, but it won't be by water next time. It'll be by fire. And the only way of escape is Jesus Christ. So again, I hope that's been a blessing to you. Keep in mind, we do have the, the resource table open. This will be your last opportunity uh, this evening to, uh, to get these resources without paying shipping. You can always order them from the website, of course, but you pay a little more. Ultimate proof of creation, which gives you a bulletproof argument for biblical creation, teaching you to think and defend the faith, really the way Jesus did in his early ministry. Very powerful. Uh, we have that on DVD as well. Astronomy reveals creation, refuting the Big Bang and the billions of years. We have that on DVD. Worlds of creation, taking on a tour of the solar system. That's a fun resource. Created Cosmos, that's the planetarium show I wrote for the Creation Museum, one of three that I wrote for them. And it's really neat. It takes you on a tour of the whole universe as far as, as, far as we can go now. We can go a little farther now with James Webb. Uh, His Star, which is about the star that led the Magi to Christ. I spoke on that the last time I was here, but we have that on DVD now. Physics of Einstein, if you'd like to learn more about what Einstein discovered and why it's really cool, because it is cool. Uh, Get Logical, that's the series of Sunday school classes I led with my, own, uh, my home church. Uh, ten Sunday school classes on logic and how to use your mind rightly to the glory of God. And don't forget about our packs, especially our library pack, which is 30% discounted. And don't forget to sign up for our free monthly newsletter. It is free. Make sure you put your email address or you'll get nothing, because it's an electronic newsletter. And then check us out on the web as well, Biblical Science Institute. And that'll, that'll keep you up to speed on what we're doing. And I should have a new book out within the next couple months. So that's really exciting. So thank you very much for having me out to speak. And why don't we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's more sure than anything else that we have because it's your word and your word is truth. And we thank you, Lord, that we live in an age where we have all this information that just confirms your word, that just where we can see these things that, that we know are true because you've said they're true, but it's so cool to be able to see them as well. And I pray that this information would, uh, that we would retain this information and be able to use it to have gospel conversations with people that we can, with gentleness, that we can, that we can lead them to you, that you might grant them repentance because only you can change a person's heart, Lord. And we ask that you would do that with, uh, this, with this nation, Lord. Just change the hearts and minds of people to turn to you, to repent from sin and trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. God bless.